Our reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. Good morning. Um, as you can probably guess, for the past few weeks, we have been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. That is the most famous public address given by Jesus in his ministry. And what's really interesting about the Sermon on the Mount is that it, the time frame in which Jesus was active in his, doing his ministry, the time frame that he gave this sermon was a time of terrible unrest. I mean, empire-wide, throughout the Roman Empire, the, the cracks were starting to show. There was a sense that the, the empire was in danger and some wanted to accelerate its degradation while others fought to preserve it. But in the country of Israel itself, where Jesus is, revolution had already been attempted several times. And, and more than that, there was this layer of religious unrest. Multiple groups that all ha were asking the question of what is our relationship as the people of God to the power of Rome? Some said we should cozy up to Rome, be allies with them, they, they, we can share interests. Some said we should revolt. And others said, you know what, we're the people of spirituality, so let's just sequester ourselves away and live quiet, pious lives. Any of that sound familiar? We too live in very unsettled times. There's a lot of questions about the validity and the integrity and the longevity of our system. And we too live in a time where many people are asking the question, what should the people of God, or how should we relate to the power? What is the church's relationship to government? and the powers of authority in our system. And here comes Jesus. And what does he say to both the people in his day and to us? But, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now what in the blue blazes does that mean? Well, let's find out together by looking at three things. We are gonna see who are the meek, we're gonna see the inheritance of the meek, and we are gonna find, look at the source of meekness, okay? Number one, who are the meek? Number two, the inheritance of the meek. Number three, the source of meekness. Okay, so first off, who are the meek, right? Uh, that's that word meek. It's not really a word we use in our common vernacular anymore. It's kind of an old English word. So for fun, when I was preparing for the sermon, I kind of asked different people, you know, what, does, what do you think the word meek means? Um, and I got a variety of answers. You know, some said humble, some said, you know, gentle or quiet. Some said 
unassuming or even timid, which all of those kind, they fit into the Webster dictionary definition of the word. But I had one friend in particular, a really close friend of mine, I thought said something really insightful. And I specifically asked her, I said, don't give me the church answer, give me the non-church answer. And you know what she said? Weak. Now I thought that had some real insight into it. And I'm gonna tell you why in just a minute, but let's ask the question, what did Jesus mean by this word? Well, in order to understand what Jesus meant, we have to know what he is quoting. He's quoting an Old Testament passage, namely Psalm 37. Now, we don't have time to go through all of Psalm 37 this morning. It's way too long, but I'm, I've given us a couple of snippets we're going to look at, and I think you'll get the, the gist of what Jesus is talking about and what the psalm is about. All right, verse one, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Verse seven, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Verse eight, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. And here we go. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. So what's happening in this psalm? Well, the psalmist is is drawing a comparison between two categories of people. The, The wicked and the righteous. Okay? Now, I want to acknowledge probably for some of us, those words have a lot of baggage right? It just conjures up feelings of that really self-righteous, holier-than-thou religion that just looks down our nose at non-believers. And I, if that's you, I, it is perfectly understandable to feel that way. But for, just for this morning, would you hold off on your assumptions about what the psalmist might mean? Let's, let's just examine what the psalm actually says. Let's, let's look at the terms as the psalmist presents them. So, what, how does the psalmist define the wicked? Who are they? What are they doing? Well, the wicked plots against the righteous. So they're plotting. The wicked borrows but does not pay back. They're financially taking advantage of others. The wicked draws the sword and bends their bow to bring down the poor and needy. They're committing acts of violence and oppression. We might say it like this. The wicked are people who are pursuing their agenda by whatever means necessary. They are committing, they're taking what they want. They're doing what they have to do to get what they want. No matter who gets hurt, they are exercising what Friedrich Nietzsche called the will to power. They are getting their slice of the pie no matter what. And if they have to steamroll other people to do it, so be it. They didn't have enough will to power. Whereas, now that's the wicked. But what are the righteous doing? Well, conversely, the righteous wait for the Lord and keep his way. They're being still. They're not responding to the wicked in kind. They're not using violence. They're being still before the Lord and they're waiting patiently for him, and they're not fretting when the wicked succeed and profit, profit off of their wickedness. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous gives gener- generously. So not only are the righteous waiting on God, but they're doing so at expense to themselves. We might say it like this, that the righteous have forsaken the will to power and they've given up fighting for their rights and instead have submitted their lives to the will of God. So do you see why what my friend said was so profound and so interesting? You see, as a woman, she is very familiar with what it feels like to be vulnerable to the power and oppression of others. And if you've ever been in a position where you've been vulnerable, you'll know that it, meekness doesn't feel like a virtue. It feels dangerous, maybe even stupid and gullible. In fact, it kind of feels like meekness is one of those virtues that the powerful promote in order to keep their power going over the powerless. 
And some have argued that. But here is Jesus saying, blessed are the meek. And if you remember, a couple weeks ago, Eric told us that that word in Greek for blessed, markios, it, it could be translated, congratulations, you're the winner. Really? What, what planet is he from? Because on this planet, the meek don't win anything, right? The, I mean, if you want to win in this world, you got to be aggressive. Be aggressive. Be aggressive. Right? Fortune favors the bold. It's survival of the fittest out there. If you, no one's going to hand you the good life. If you want a slice of the pie, you got to get yours. As the Beastie Boys once said, you got to fight for your right to partay. Even Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of our nation, said, God helps those who help themselves. The meek? Well, they get steamrolled. They get taken advantage of. They get, uh, they get crushed. Everybody knows if you want to get ahead in this life, you got to be assertive. You got to be confident. You got to be bold. If you're not assertive, if you're timid, you get forgotten. You get left out. And yet, Jesus has the audacity to say that the meek are blessed. How does that work? Well, what have we just seen? Who are the meek? The meek are those who've relinquished the will to power. They've given up fighting for their rights and have submitted their lives to the will of God. And the only way, and, so, and of course that raises the question for us, well, how can that be blessed? Because it doesn't look like that in the world that we live in. Well, Jesus answers that question with our second point, which is, well, they inherit something. What is it exactly that the meek inherit? Well, Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. Again, what's Jesus talking about? Well, to understand this, we have to go back to how Jesus set up the entire Sermon on the Mount, right? He prefaces the entire Sermon on the Mount with right before that he had been proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is near. Or you could also say the kingdom of God. And we learned in the very first sermon of the series that that phrase, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, that's a shorthand way of talking about God's restoration plan. God has been unfolding this plan all throughout human history from the very beginning to restore everything. Ever since the very first human beings rebelled against God and betrayed him and they brought evil and suffering and tragedy and sickness and death into the world. Since that day, God has been promising and has been slowly unfolding this plan to renew everything, to once again make the entire world, the entire universe, a place of perfect peace and harmony and life and flourishing the kind of place that we all wish it was right now. But a central part of God's restoration plan is his promise for justice. We sang about it earlier. God promises that there is a day coming where he is going to bring back to life every human being that has ever lived, body and soul, and we will stand before our maker and we will answer for the life that we have lived. And on that day, the perpetrators of wickedness, the, those who have oppressed and who've taken what does not belong to them, who advanced their agenda at the expense of others, they will have to answer for their wickedness. And God will bring judgment upon them, wiping them away from planet Earth. The, Psalms, the psalmist talks about it. Over, it's not just in this verse, but all throughout the psalm, you'll see, he says, the wicked will perish. And the enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures, meaning flowers. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. 
And what does that leave? <coughs> Excuse me. That leaves the righteous, the meek, as the, the ones left standing on God's renewed and restored earth. Now, two things that I would like for us to see about this promise of justice. One, it's something Eric said last week, that there is no divide between the spiritual and the physical. That a, the true biblical Christian vision of the future is not some spiritualized, ethereal plane somewhere out there, right? But it's, it's grounded on this planet. It's this earth, this planet that the righteous are going to inherit. Only it's this planet the way we all wish it was right now. Second thing, I know that this idea of God wiping away the wicked raises all kinds of issues for us. Like questions about hell and God's justice and his goodness and how, like, how does that, how can a good God do that? And I'm, unfortunately, we really don't have time this morning to unpack all of that, okay? If, if you have questions around that stuff, great. We have talked about it before in prior sermons, and we will talk about this stuff again. And I would strongly encourage you, email me or Pastor Eric or one of our elders and just bring us your questions. We welcome those questions, okay? But for the time being, the thing about God's justice that I really want you to see this morning is that we want it. We actually really want the wicked to get wiped away. We deeply, deeply long for justice. And unless you've been living under a rock, it, that's obvious right now, isn't it? I mean, we, our society is clamoring, is desperate for justice right now, aren't we? Everywhere you look, whether it's, you know, hashtag me too, whether it's gl cl uh, climate change, whether it's Occupy Wall Street, whether it's Black Lives Matter or defund the police, whether it's about issues of immigration or uh, LGBTQ rights, or whether it's about abortion or even something like minimum wage, whatever it is, whatever your issue, whether you re lean right or left, we want justice. We all sort of sense right now that there, there's something happening and it's not right. And there are people who are getting hurt, people even getting killed. And others are benefiting from that. And that needs to stop. And we somehow intuitively understand that the only way justice can be brought to bear is if the perpetrators of injustice are removed from their ability to continue per perpetuating injustice. They have to be held accountable for their actions, don't they? We want justice, we long for it, and we know that the source of the injustice have to be dealt with. But there's a problem. The problem is that we don't listen to the psalmist. We try to take justice into our own hands. We, dis we have a restoration plan for ourselves. We have our own version of the kingdom of heaven and we think it gets built by our hands. And so we respond in kind. We fight back. We fight for our rights. And inevitably, what ends up happening is exactly what the psalmist warns us against. When we give ourselves over to our anger, Righteous anger, right? It's good and right to be angry at injustice, but when we give ourselves up to it, suddenly we find ourselves in the very camp of the people we were so angry at. We, we just replicate the very injustice that we were so upset about. And guys, history bears this out. Most revolutions in human history replaced one tyrant for another. One kind of oppression for another and they were bathed in blood. And even the best revolutions, the most peaceable revolutions, did they really bring the justice that you and I long for? Not really. It was proximate justice. It was better if it lasted. So 
But on the other hand, it's the meek. It's those who have forsaken, fighting for their rights, who have relinquished the will to power that are in the posture that they can receive the justice that God has promised to give. And they will be left standing. Who are the meek? The meek are those who have relinquished the will to power, who have forsaken, who stopped fighting for their rights and have submitted their lives to the will of God. The inheritance of the weak is the very ground we stand on because God has promised to bring justice to bear against the wicked, wiping them away from planet Earth so that it will be the meek who are left to enjoy God's renewed and restored creation. But that brings us to our third point, the source. Okay, where does meekness come from? How do we get it? Right, I think we all agree, yes, we want justice, I, I, I like that, and I don't wanna be in the camp of the wicked, ha ha ha, right? So how do, we, how do we get counted in the ranks of the righteous? Where, where does meekness come from? Do you just try harder? Do you just, I'm gonna be really meek today, right? No. Friends, meekness, isn't a virtue that we aspire to. It's a person. You see, Jesus uses that word meek one other time in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 25, and he's talking about himself. It is Jesus who throughout his ministry proclaimed, I have not come to do my will, but I have come to do the will of the one who sent me. Jesus is the one truly righteous person. Jesus is the one truly meek person that has ever lived, who never once took up the will to power, even though he had every right to. He submitted his life to the very will of the Father, and at great cost to himself. When wicked men came and they tried to arrest him unjustly, he did not take up the sword, though his disciples tried to get him to do so. And when those same wicked men drug him before a kangaroo court and they laid false accusations at him and tried to condemn him unfairly to push forward their agenda, Jesus did not open his mouth to defend himself. Jesus was perfectly meek and it took him to the cross. And on the cross, the Lord Jesus as he hung there, was surrounded by people who laughed at him and who mocked him and were like, see, that's where wickedness is gonna get you. Or that's what, not wickedness, that's where meekness is gonna get you. See, that's where it leads. But they couldn't see something. There was something invisible happening in that moment that they could not see. That in that moment where it looked like Jesus would had, was at his most and utterly weak, he was actually exercising cosmic strength because he was taking in his body on the cross our wickedness. He was taking all of the instances where we pushed our agenda and other people got hurt, where we were cruel where we benefited off of the suffering of others. And let's be honest, if you live in this country, you have absolutely benefited off the suffering of others. Just follow the paper trail of the clothes you're wearing right now. On the cross, Jesus took all of our greed, all of our exploitations and our lies and our selfishness. He took it all. And on the cross, God the Father wiped it from planet Earth. So that now, if you're in Jesus, if your faith is in Jesus, everything that the meek one, the truly righteous one has coming to him belongs to you. And on the third day, Jesus rose up from death, making proof, a final stamp of declaration that yes, indeed, the day is coming where God is gonna make good on his promise. The earth will be made new. Everything will be restored. And everyone who is in the righteous category, meaning they are in the righteous one, will inherit that renewed and glorified earth. So friend, if you're in Jesus, 
You don't have to take up arms against the wicked. You don't have to fight for your rights because Jesus has already fought for them for you and they're being held securely in his hand. When people put labels on you and they accuse you, calling you things that are unfair and hurtful, you don't have to defend yourself because the judge of the entire universe is your defender. You don't have to get your slice of the pie. Jesus bought the pie for you by his blood. You have something. If you're in Jesus, you have something that the wicked will never have. Security. You see, when you get what you have through your own efforts and by the sweat of your brow and by your own force and by your will to power, everything you have is now at risk. It's up to you to keep that will to power going to protect what's yours until somebody with a little bit more will to power comes along and threatens it. But when you relinquish that and you submit your life to the Lord Jesus, people can take away your stuff, your money, your land, your reputation, even your very life, and it will be given back to you, renewed, restored for eternity on the day that he returns. They can't touch you. Who are the meek? The meek are those who relinquish the will to power, who give up fighting for their rights and submit to the will of God. What is the inheritance of the meek? the very ground we stand on. Because God has promised to bring justice to bear against the wicked and to wipe it away from planet Earth so that the, it is the meek who will be left standing on God's renewed and restored creation. And what is the source of meekness? It's the Lord Jesus, the truly meek one, the truly righteous one who submitted his very life to the will of God in order to secure your place on his renewed planet. Now, friends, I know this raises all kinds of questions for us about, whoa, 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 hold on. What about speaking truth to power? What about standing up for the oppressed and the marginalized, you know, the orphan and the widow? Isn't that part of this equation too? Yes, and I've got good news for you. Jesus will actually begin to answer those questions later on in the Sermon on the Mount. So please keep coming. But the question I want to leave you with today is this. If Jesus submitted his life to the will of God on your behalf, are you willing to submit your life to him? Let me pray. Father, thank you that we are truly and completely secure. You have made us your children who will inherit everything that Jesus deserves to inherit if we are simply in him. It is done by, it has been secured by you. It, your work is done through you and we can rest. Help us to do that. Forgive us that we so often live lives that are like those who don't know you. We think it's up to us to secure our future. We think it's us to protect our reputations. We think it's up to us to protect what's ours, but we don't. Help us to live like who we really are. Your people who can rest and who can trust that everything we want, everything we need will be given to us and it cannot be taken away. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And for your glory's sake and in your name we pray, amen.